Hello, I'm John the Engineer, the only banking systems engineer on the planet. And with the banking system crashing everywhere, maybe you'd like to know what the only banking systems engineer on the planet would do. I would do what they did in Argentina. In 2001, you know, the banking system crashed. You probably heard about it. Did you hear that in 2006, they paid off all their IMF World Bank debt? They went from broke in 2001 with the bank shutting their doors and people not being able to get their money, which has been predicted is going to happen in the United States too. And five years later, all IMF World Bank debt paid off two years early. How'd they do that? We should do the same thing. We can do the same thing. So I'm going to give you a little lesson in banking systems engineering. Not too hard to understand. You have to understand that I first ran in politics to legalize gambling. I was known as the great Canadian gambler. I was a teaching assistant of the mathematics of gambling course at Carleton University for four years after my degree in electrical engineering. And I've been a professional gambler for the past 35 years, which has paid for my politics and my missions. And uh, I ran for parliament to legalize gambling. And they asked me, hey, tell us about inflation. I said, hey, my casino bank has chips, different colors and denominations, and the government's bank has currency, different colors and denominations. So I said, how come this one suffers inflation and this one doesn't? The hardware is identical. Inflation must be a software problem. So I did an engineering analysis. It's been published, known as Bank Math. It's at my website, johntermel.com slash bankmath.htm, and it explains how I can make my poker chips inflate, and once you learn how to make chips that used to not inflate start inflating, you can also learn how to stop money from inflating. So here's a little lesson in banking systems engineering. Where does money come from? The inner workings of the banking system are mysterious to many, but no matter how complex it can be reduced to having the money plates. Whether they be plates for changing metal into coins, plates for changing paper into notes, or plates inside a bank's computer changing electrical blips into bank deposits on which checks may be written. Since changes in the money supply are regularly reported in the media, money must enter the supply from a source and leave through a sink. Our liquidity system has both a tap and a drain. The easiest way to model our system of financial liquidity is with plumbing. All banking systems have the same exterior connections to the economy, which you can think of as the pool where people splash around with their funds. You have figure two, which is the interior of a piggy bank, reservoir system. It shows that a deposit is first made into the reservoir, and a loan is then taken out of the reservoir, which causes no increase in the money supply. Conversely, when a loan is paid, it goes into the reservoir and there's no decrease in the money supply. Though the Bank of Canada operates a small tap and adds a small amount of high-powered money to the money supply, about 2%, I searched the Parliamentary Library in Canada years ago and found a quote from 1939 by Graham Towers, Governor of the Bank of Canada, pointing out that quote, the banks do not lend out the money of their depositors. Each and every time a bank makes a loan, new bank credit is created, new deposits, brand new money. Unquote. Say what? Figure 3 is the interior plumbing of a chartered bank, which shows that it has a tap and is not the pure reservoir system like the piggy bank model. The loans do not come out of the savings reservoir, but they come out of the tap of new money, like a casino bank, not a piggy bank. When a chartered bank makes a loan, the amount of money in circulation goes up. When a loan is repaid, it goes down, the drain. In the textbook Economics by Lipsy Sparks Steiner, it states, quote, the banking system as a whole can create deposit money, unquote. Therefore, the banks have all their very own tap, their very own set of electronic money plates. How banks conceal their creation of money. 
The injection of new money from their taps has been well hidden from the public view because the Bank Act insists that before any new money may be loaned into circulation, old money must be deposited into the reservoir. It's as if a casino were to insist on old chips being put into the safety deposit section before it would issue new chips. By merely matching new loans to deposits, this brilliant cover for the turning on of the tap misleads observers into falsely concluding that a chartered bank operates like a piggy bank. With a lawful reason to seek deposits before they can lend, there is no outward difference between chartered bank and a piggy bank. Yet banks do not seek deposits to lend to other people. They seek them to lawfully turn on the tap of new money, leaving depositors old deposits in their accounts. It's a fascinatingly tricky mechanism, but its purpose is to foster the impression that borrowers are getting savers' deposits and that savers therefore deserve to get interest for lending borrowers their money. This may surely have been true when banking did operate like a piggy bank without the creation of new money, but it certainly is not now true that banks operate more like a casino bank issuing new liquidity. The matching of loans to deposits successfully hides the fact that no one is giving up the current use of their money since it is new money being loaned out and therefore no one is being deprived of the use of their money. The problem is that the bank's reserve ratio forces a limit on how much they can lend out. Let's say someone deposits $100 in savings to the reservoir. They're allowed to lend out $90 new dollars out of the tap, letting the money supply go up $90. That $90 goes up to the pool and eventually finds its way into a savings deposit for someone else. And when that 90 hits a reservoir in a bank, they're allowed to turn on their tap and let out 81 new dollars. And when that $81 circulates around and lands in a savings account back in a reservoir or in a bank, they're allowed to lend out 72 new dollars. And that goes on and on and on and on until they end up lending out a complete new $900 based on the $100 with a 10% reserve ratio. With a 5% reserve ratio, they could turn that over and over and over and actually create $1,900 with that $100. This is the second big lie of economics, and you can catch any economist by simply asking them, hey, when I get a loan from a bank, where'd that money come from? And they'll always say, from their depositors' funds. And you say, yeah, but doesn't the reserve ratio and the multiplier effect say that they're lending out brand new money? And they go, that's right, without realizing that the money can't be coming out of the reservoir and coming out of the tap at the same time. It has to be one or the other. And, of course, Graham Towers said that it was coming out of the tap. So, that is how they do that. Now, obviously, when you make a payment on your principal, they destroy that money. And the amount of money in supply goes down. So, when a large withdrawal is made, for instance, or a large failure is written off of the bank's books, the amount in the reservoir goes down. And the reverse reserve ratio takes place. Since losses are covered from the reserves, when that happens, they have to subtract money from the economy and call in their loans. It's quite an automatic doomsday mechanism. It was bankers calling in loans which precipitated the 1929 stock market crash. As people fail to meet their call and those loans are written off, again reducing bank reserves, more loans must again be automatically called in and credit cut off. The process gets worse and worse and causes the banking system to fail. Any cabal of rich men can precipitate such a credit crunch by simply moving their savings to another country, which forces the banks in the target country to start calling in loans. Such private power over the world's financial system is inappropriate. So now you know that the second big lie of economics is that bankers do not lend out their depositors' funds. Each and every time a bank makes a loan, new bank credits are created. Now, it gets worse when they start charging interest, and that's going to come up in the next example. But just remember, banks do not operate like piggy banks. They operate like casino banks with a limit, depending on how many chips are deposited in the safety deposit section, which limits how much they can lend out of new chips. A pretty stupid limit on your ability to lend out new chips if people have collateral. Interest, next lesson.